You know Suzuki? Their former president once came to the factory and ordered that all the lights be cleared out. As a result, he saved $40,000 a year. There was also a time when he used to fire all the ladies, saying that they were just showing the way to the guests and they could be replaced by plastic arrows. That's the Suzuki tradition. These guys don't invest huge sums of money into Batmobiles. Their cars are relatively small, but their tentacles are deep in 190 countries in the world where they are stuffing their cars, winning over the dealers of guns and marijuana. In this video, we'll give you a business guide. You'll learn how to produce this, this, and this, starting from a sewing factory. Yes, yes, you didn't mishear that. Suzuki rose from a loom. Suzuki, like Toyota's, grew out of a loom. Michio Suzuki, the company's founder, was born in 1887. He grew up in a family of farmers who were responsible for the cotton plantations. Michio himself worked in the fields from the age of seven or eight, following his father's example. The boy had a reputation as a skilled fellow. When Michio was 14, his father became worried. What if his son would gather all the cotton? Just as the panda, Ho, went to Master Shifu, or Luke Skywalker met Obi-Wan Kenobi, Michio ended up with master carpenter, Kotara Imamura, who may have given the enterprising boy's engineering mind a head start. Michio grew by leaps and bounds. His teacher, Kotaro, immediately noticed the boy's intelligence and predicted a bright future for his young Padawan. Just a few more years, but here comes the problem. In 1904, when Michio was 17, the Russo-Japanese War broke out. When the Russian ships were at war with Japanese cruisers, the country had little time for needlework. They had a war to fight, so the only thing Michio could do was work on weaving looms. Imamura, his foreman, thought the apprentice was too capable to waste his time on such nonsense, but the boy liked the work, and then this experience became a trick up his sleeve. 1909, the war had long since ended, Michio Suzuki inherits his father's silk mill and quickly rebuilds it into a loom factory. A mini plant was not enough for the young enthusiast. A little later, he invented a foot-operated loom, which embroidered patterns 10 times faster. Suzuki gave his first product to his mother, Learn, children, and then began to stamp copies of it. Before Michio, Japanese homes had a jibata machine. It was a bulky machine where you had to put your butt in the saddle, stick your left heel in the loop, and, leaning on the hinged backrest, weave the cherished threads, building up the hump on your strained back. It looked like the natives' trap from Pirates of the Caribbean. Michio Suzuki invented the pedaling machine. You sit and spin the pedals, just like on a bicycle. The machine was much more convenient and quickly sold out. Michio then realized that it was necessary to do business, and so it went. In 1909, he founded Suzuki Loom Manufacturing Company, which sounds cooler and has an official label. Michio's business was thriving. No matter how much revenue the firm brought in, more dough was needed every year. But here's the catch. The factory was already filled to capacity. The worker was sitting on the worker. The machines were drawn close together, and therefore, to expand the business, huge amounts of money were needed. But it wasn't without reason that the Suzuki name became iconic. Michio went to the stock exchange and said, why don't you invest a lot of money in me and I'll give you a percentage of the profits. The big-bellied Japanese quickly realized that Michio's business would make them a lot of money. They quickly poured money into him. Sales increased. And our hero paid them a percentage, which, in general, didn't bother him too much. In short, Michio collected dough and poured it into the development of the factory. By 1922, he had squeezed out all competitors and made it to the leading positions in Japan. But Suzuki didn't stop at his native country either. He began to distribute the looms abroad. 
in India and Southeast Asia, where the Suzuki brand was similar to what is in the inscription made in Germany now. But where are the cars, you ask? When will there be Grand Vitara, motorcycle races, cruise control, and all that stuff? Not much left, folks. World War II rumbled, and the firm's business turned upside down. The troubles began with market oversaturation. Simply put, everyone bought up the machines and there were fewer and fewer customers. Suzuki was thinking of changing the company's course. Having scratched his gray hair, he decided to refocus on automobiles. And the decision was right. After all, Japan had about 20,000 cars imported each year, and this in the third decade of the 20th century, just before the war. Naturally, it was not enough for all Japanese people, and no one in the land of the rising sun made them. So Michio decided to take over the automobile industry in his motherland. There was a problem. The Japanese did not know how to design cars. So they took such a baby from Great Britain, took it apart, and made a scheme for reassembling the car at home. The car was assembled and put to the test, which fortunately went well. And now, it seems that we can put the car into production, but it's not. War broke out, the second of the world wars and the second in Michio Suzuki's life. The Japanese government did not want to hear anything about car production, tanks, helmets, and bullets. That's all that's necessary for a happy life. Michio froze the project. He revived production after the war, but then it almost collapsed. Poverty, hunger, and misery. That's what the Japanese people got after the war. The state did nothing to help the people. And the workers decided it was time to take matters into their own hands. After the war, the communists came out of the prisons. They quickly jumped up on barrels and shouted a few slogans, but it was enough to get millions. Yes, millions of workers to follow them. Strikes broke out all over the country. Sailors, railroad workers, coal miners, even civil servants went on strike. Some barricaded themselves in their offices. Some came out in demonstrations, all under communist slogans. Give us food, give us water, give us wages, and more and more. Strikes and protests swept the Suzuki factories too. Poor Michio could barely make ends meet. The workers rebelled. No one wanted the looms. The factories were slowly falling apart, but Mr. Suzuki found a way to get by. He started producing drags and plows, saws and planers, heaters and musical instruments. Michio had a feel for what poor people needed, and this enabled him to emerge from the abyss of chaos. 1946, business was slowly improving. Mr. Suzuki receives orders for weaving looms, but that all went down the drain too. There was too little cotton in the country, so the looms were no longer needed. What to do? It was unclear what to sell. Suzuki wanted to produce cars, but there was simply no money for expensive parts. The situation seemed hopeless, but then a dramatic accident happened. One day Michio's son was riding a bicycle. The boy was riding uphill and was out of breath while pushing the tight pedals. Suddenly, an idea struck him. What if he built a bicycle with a motor? It would ride itself without any effort. When Suzuki Jr. arrived home, he quickly sketched out a blueprint of a bike with a motor. Michio appreciated his son's talent and patted him on the head and adopted the idea, which brought the company out of the financial crisis. Mopeds poured out of the conveyors in droves. Suzuki strengthened and improved bikes with motors, and in 1951, it released the first model, Power Free. Exactly this gizmo has become the prototype for future mopeds of the company. The number of orders increased, but not by much. Do you know why? The moped market in the 1950s was taken over by Soichiro Honda, the entrepreneur who went from being a janitor to a powerful businessman. Want to know a secret? 
the Honda video is already on the channel. Click on the hint before it fades away. All of Japan rode Honda mopeds, and Mr. Suzuki realized he needed to upgrade his bikes. In 1952, he gives the world a motorcycle called the Diamond Free. Yes, it looks like a medieval machine, but a year later this bike won the Fujiyama Volcano Race. Suzuki had both advertising and a trick up his sleeve. According to Japan's traffic code, anyone could buy a motorcycle with a small engine without a license. Orders poured in like falling from the sky. However, Suzuki understood that soon, cars would drive around Japan and either Honda or he would produce them. In five years, Suzuki assembled Suzu Light, which was a difficult machine to drive, but its stuffing was far ahead of its time. Its mechanisms were very reliable, like the doors, steering wheel, and levers. Isn't that enough for a typical housekeeper's car? And if the car broke down, why not buy a new one? Hands and feet already got used to driving. The palm itself rests on the gear stick, and it was the first car in the Japanese market. Sekiro Honda assembled the car in only nine years, and Suzuki was already reigning in the market. But to rule the market is one thing, and to run a company is another. Years flew by, and Michio Suzuki was 70 years old already. At this age, in 1957, he left the company and became CEO. Michio lived to be 90 years old. Let's honor the memory of the glorious old man who spent his life toiling for the good of the family name. The identities of the following Suzuki executives are obscure. Nothing is known about them. The data is all mixed up. In general, the whole CIA archive. We only know that the company began to stamp boat motors, such hippie vans, off-road vehicles for safari, and even some DeLoreans. Only the following year that a real shogun, the emperor of the automobile industry of Japan, Osamu Suzuki, sat on the throne of the company. Osamu was the son-in-law of the company owner. By marrying his daughter Shoko, he cut his way to the presidency and started to spread his tentacles to other countries. India, Pakistan, Vietnam, Egypt, where Kalashnikov rifles were well snapped up. Cheap cars will come in handy, and Osamu knew it. The new president made a deal with General Motors, and the two car giants started to take over Europe together. Osamu Suzuki liked to save money. He cut all unnecessary parts of the cars. He cut all unnecessary employees. For sure, he would cut something off from himself too if that part seemed unnecessary. Mr. Osamu once ordered the factories to clear off the streetlights. As a result, he saved $40,000 a year and he once fired a bunch of ladies from headquarters because the female employees were showing visitors the way, and plastic arrows could do that too. Mr. Suzuki even saved on paint, not for cars, but for the walls of his factories. All in all, Osamu was a dictator. Nevertheless, he had 60 factories in 31 countries and sales in 190 countries by the turn of the century. Suzuki crossed the 10 million assembled cars mark under his leadership. New cars. Constant victories in races. The company even was developing moon rovers together with Google. In general, Osamu had tried hard. Even though he retired last year, the company firmly listens to his advice. By all the laws of physics, the company should have collapsed wars, strikes, and powerful competitors. The company not only went through that, but also made the most of it. But now the eye of Suzuki Automotive Shogunate stretches over the whole globe. In 2009, the company opened its own museum. There are looms and motorized bicycles and their first cars in general. 
everything that a beginning businessman should be inspired by. If you want something newer, check out the Suzuki Grand Vitara. If you have money, install touchscreens, panoramic sunroofs, and displays, which will project speeds directly on the windshield. In addition, you can put in a rear camera so you don't have to crush grannies when parking. Seat ventilation is also available. And no, we don't get paid for advertising. We don't have any money, so we just get by on whatever we can find on the street. The only thing you can support us with is likes and subscriptions. We hope that the Suzuki Samurai Way has inspired you, and we'll see you again.